Right. Uh -huh. Why don't we say a quick word of prayer and then we'll get started. It's just lovely to see you all. Folks will be coming in. I know uh, as we as we continue to go. Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. Bill is in. This is wonderful. There's Bill. Okay. So we're going to we're seeing everybody. Hey, but Bill. right now, Lord, we are so grateful for this time together. God, I thank you for the joy that's just bubbling up already in the, in this class. Just, just life. God, we thank you. We thank you that you have kept us and protected us. You continue to see about us and you continue to encourage us to see and look in on one another. God, we thank you for the progress that Chris is making as he recovers from COVID. We thank you for the progress that we're seeing in Bill as he's recovering as well. God, we thank you for what we're seeing with Dr. Terrell and and, and uh, Jada as they recover from their bout with COVID. We lift up others in who are in our number who either by extension or by extended family are dealing with this virus as well. God, I pray that you will be with them, keep them in their bodies, keep them in their spirits, make them strong in their hearts and their minds. God, we lift up our nation, the United States to you. We need you. We just need you. We need you to be with us and we need you to just give us some patience and some strength and some, some fortitude to come through what is certain to be a bumpy ride in the next few weeks. But we know that you don't leave us, and so we're going to rely on you to be with us. And now I pray that you'll be with us in tonight's study. Uh, open our hearts, our minds, our ears to what you would have us know and say. I thank you for everyone who's here, and I thank you for what's about to unfold. We ask this all in the name of your beloved son, Jesus. Amen. 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 I'm going to share my screen now with y'all. Here we go. Uh, give me a second. Whoop, whoop, whoop. We'll go right here and into this. Then I got to get out of show. Oh, I'm, I'm in the middle of a, a huge project at work where we are rehearsing this pitch over and over again. And I just, I'm so tired of, of Zoom slides and stuff like that and show mode. And it's crazy. Okay, quick announcements. Uh, are we all good? Can you see the screen? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Mm -hmm. Well, I keep moving, this keeps going around because I keep moving my mouse and it keeps changing things. So our next big YouTube service is going to be on the 29th. That is the first Sunday of Advent. So we have to do Advent, but because we only meet once a month, we're going to do all of Advent in I sat down and did the service flow in 59 minutes, y'all. We're going to set a world's record to do all, <laughs> all of Advent in, in 59 minutes. And it's going to be quite lovely. And it's going to feature show tunes and readings and all of that. There's a lot. I'm going to be sending out emails tomorrow, some with spe specific asks of folks. Uh, we're going to be lighting all four of the candles, and so we're going to need some folks to do that. There are going to be some other things. We also will have some backup vocals for some solo pieces. Uh, those of you that know Rocky Horror Picture Show, you will have a number. Uh, those of you that love Hairspray, there's a number from Hairspray in there. Uh, I can rattle off the other shows. Let me see. There's some West Side Story in there. There's some Wiz in there. There's a lot of stuff going on. So it's a, a going to be a beautiful and a lovely service, and we're looking very much forward to it. Um, and so uh, begin to look, watch for email. That's my task tomorrow is to get out those emails now that we've kind of got all of the service order worked out. We are in the first of three lessons that we're calling The Othering, where we are looking at texts that have been misused to defame non-Christians and women and people of color. Tonight, we're going to focus at, on the way of Jesus and the ways of others. And this actually is uh, kind of, it was, I love when these things happen, whenever our study series are sort of generated out of conversations that we've had in other studies. And so this is kind of what happened here. And it all started with Jeff asking a simple question of, you know, we've been raised with these scriptures. They've sort of been, in, you know, sort of tattooed in our, in our heads. What do we do with this? And so this is going to be our attempt uh, to do something with this. And I'm not going to promise 100% success, but what I will promise is that we're going to be really imaginative and we're going to be very, very uh, thorough and we're going to really have a good time with it. So uh, tonight we're going to look at the first one is how a lot of Christians are so determined to be exclusively right that they actually defame and dehumanize people with other beliefs? And how do we get there? What are those verses that people use? What could they possibly mean? Are there, are there other ways of reading those verses? 
all of that kind of stuff is where we're going to begin with that. But as we were working last week on, the, I mean, in the last study about sort of uh, re respecting indigenous lands, I thought I would adapt that idea to the idea of how quite often we take up too much space in the religious world as well. And so um, let me see. Well, Jeff, since you sort of got us in this, this, this study series, why don't you kick us off by just reading this kind of diversity acknowledgement? Because I want us to also, as we're thinking about being responsible with where we are in terms of Native American peoples and that we are on land that did not belong to the, to, to the, you know, the, the countries that we come from, we also quite often take up too large a footprint with some of our ideas, not this group in particular, but Christians do. And so I'm kind of wanting to convert some of these ideas. And so Jeff, why don't you give us a, just a, a read of this? Cause I want us to kind of be aware of some of these things. You gotta unmute. unmute. There. Yeah, uh, okay, uh, I'm glad to. Uh, diversity mm -hmm. acknowledgement. Justice calls us to recognize and create space to heal from long histories of religious intolerance that still impact us today. In this spirit, we begin by recognizing Christianity's history of wars, violence, oppression, and bigotry targeting people of other faiths. We have perpetuated theologies and ideologies intended to terrorize and disenfranchise those who don't subscribe to Christian doctrines and practices. We join in acknowledging communities whose beliefs differ from our own. We honor their elders past and present, as well as future generations. We repent of our unwillingness to make room for others, ignoring that we are all finding our way, often in different and seemingly contradictory manners. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to dismantle ongoing legacies of faith-based prejudice. I would like us to sit with that just for a minute because if we think about either our upbringings or even some of our own reflexes even to this day, quite often we have a tendency to wear the big C, if you will, right? The big C on our, on our sweaters. Yeah, well, we're Christians and everybody else is that thing, you know? And I don't know what that is, that's something else. And to minimize and not understand that many of these people that, and I'm not saying this about this group, but I think we've been around Christians who tend to do this sort of thing, right? Well, you know, the Christians are all right, and, you know, I don't know about those Hindus, they've got all those gods. And just totally dismiss an entire religious system that people cherish and hold dear, that they bank their lives on and build their lives around. And there's a challenge with that. And a lot of it, to Jeff's point that triggered this entire study, a lot of that is rooted with the people doing a whole lot of ripping of scripture out of context and sort of weaponizing texts that kind of give people the other hand. And so when we taught, when I was thinking about this study and I said, you know, and Shane and I were talking about it being a study about de-othering, de-othering, it is because that's effectively what a lot of Christians do. They other people of other faiths, right? It's like, okay, there's us and then there's everybody else and everybody else is othered. And, and, in and even, uh, you can even get that sort of Southern politeness gets involved in it, you know, or that American politeness, oh yes, you know, I respect, I respect your right to believe however you would believe, but the subtext of that respect is kind of like the Christian version of bless our heart, right? It is like, you know, I respect your right to believe whatever it is you want to believe, but we all know that it ain't right, that what I believe is right and this other stuff is something else, right? There is that kind of way that we have, and it is so prevalent in so many different ways, and we even do it in our own circle. We always... Some of us other other kinds of Christians, right? It's like, well, you know, well, you're a Christian, but not really. And there's this challenge for us not to really sort of respect the fact that we live in a pluralistic society, that we live in a place where faith is very real for everyone who claims it, whatever they're claiming it as. That faith is real. I was watching last night, uh, and Lisa, I actually thought of you because of a comment you made many years on, on, ago on Facebook when I was watching it. David Letterman was interviewing Lizzo. And, and he's talking to Lizzo and Lizzo's talking about her background and stuff. And then she got up and she, 
showed him, and these are my crystals, and I do this with my crystals. And my first reflex, being a kid that was raised in evangelical Christianity, was like, oh, Lord, here we go with the crystals. <laughs> I immediately, you know, my first reflex was to other her. And that's just, we have to be, we have to know that these reflexes get built into us. By, Can in I tell so you a short anecdote? Yes, go ahead. I grew up Catholic and we were taught you're supposed to bow your head when you pass a Catholic church because Jesus is there in the blessed sacrament. My dad used to take the family on trips in the car, like to the lake and stuff. And if uh -huh. he didn't know what kind of church it is, he'd bow his head up and down and say, if it is, and he shake his head the other way if it isn't. <laughs> you see, my mother told me that she stuff. Catholic uh -huh. had to cross the street mm -hmm. if they were walking past a non-Catholic church when she was a kid. <sighs> yeah. And all of that sort of it all filters into this weird kind of superstition, doesn't it? You know what what's going to happen if you don't? You know what would happen to you? You know it's that kind of stuff, right? There is this idea that, and this we're getting to this, this idea of categorical thinking around us and religion and one another and all of that kind of things, you know? It's like, just quickly, let's do a quick little, play, play a quick little game. Uh, give me, just call them out, ways that we could, we, that we categorize people, just all the different ways we categorize <clears throat> people and we make assumptions about them based on that category. Somebody name something. That. So I say what? Fat. Fat. Okay. So weight is one thing we make assumptions, right? Something else. How do we categorize? Or rural. Rural. Or urban. Young. Young. Yeah. What else oh. you got? Race. Race. Yes. Southern. Race is big. Go Southern ahead. Southern accent. Accents. Whoa! Yeah. Who said that? <laughs> Jeff Cobb. <laughs> Okay, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> Homeless, dirty, mm -hmm. <laughs> educated, not ed right? Beautiful. Educated, not educated. Handsome. Weird. All of those things, right? Political, um, political party. Political party. Chicago was... accents. Say again. I'm going to say American. Chicago accents. I'm kidding. I'm just messing with Jeff. <laughs> Yeah. American, American <laughs> and European, right? All of these things. Yeah. When I was growing up, my my father came from a real, really stiff Southern preppy house. Now I know you all might think you know preppies, but you don't know preppies until you know Southern preppies. Southern preppies are a little crazy. And uh, there was a thing that even though my grandparents were some of the most wonderful Christian people in the world, there was a thing called NOKD. Does anybody know what NOKD stands for? In prep talk, in, in prep talk on the East Coast and down South, it means not our kind here. Oh my God. And there would be times whenever we would be with, or some somebody would come in and my mother, just come over here, you know, that NOKD darling, NOKD. <gasps> And it was just that we don't associate with those kinds of people. And they were Christians, but there was a category that they fit into, right? There was a way that we had decided this idea of categorization that is really problematic, right? The great Jewish philosopher of the 20th century, Martin Buber, took a look at this idea and his whole life was built around this idea of otherness and othering. And he kind of said there are two kinds of relationships that go in the world whether it's us and God or us and one another or us and strangers or our nations. He said there are two kinds. There, are, there is the I and the it, which is the way we would experience a detached thing, he says. In other words, this is what we have to say about these people or this thing. It's monological. It's turning from, it's turning from you and into myself to everything that I think. Are you tracking with this? I have othered you based entirely on what my perceptions are, what my knowledge, what my experience is. It's, and it is always really about me. When I'm looking at something and I'm just categorizing, the way I am classifying you is really about me. And it really is how are you, how are you serving my purposes? How am I putting you in my place? Now, Boober's very clear about this, that it's necessary 
this is a necessary strategy that we have because if we spent all of our, if we didn't, if we weren't able to do those things, we would never get through the day. All right, we have to sort of do these things from a pragmatic standpoint. Okay, I know, I know that you are the you are the paper boy, and I know that you deliver my paper every morning, and I'm still one of those old people that gets the paper every day, and so you know every now and then I'll be up and the paper will drop and I'll open the door and I'll see the paper boy. That's he's the paper boy. I don't know his name. I don't have, I don't, it, it's not for lack of wanting. I've just categorized him. That's his role in my life is to make sure that I get a paper every day. And that's how I've categorized him. There is that kind of a, a, a detachment going on. But Buber says that meaning does not really happen in that kind of arrangement in that kind of understanding of the other. He says that meaning happens when we get into what he calls the I and the thou relationship where there is a participation between what he calls participation, not experience, participation between two whole beings. And now it turns from me talking to you or about you from a monologue into a dialogue and we turn toward each other. And this is now about more than my individuality. That's why I'm really get tired of people talking about, well, I'm just a rugged individualist. I'm like, well, that just means that it's really all about you. That's not really, that doesn't help me. You're not offering me anything if you're a rugged individualist. But it's he, but Buber says it's about personality. It is about the fulfilled difference that I make in your life. It is about what makes me different. And I am living into all of what makes me different and how that can contribute to your life. And therefore, we are in some ways opposites, but there is shared meaning between us. Who you are wholly and who I am holy, somehow or another comes together in the middle. And I was thinking about how I could explain this because it gets really, he gets really abstract real quickly, Boober does. When Walt and I were maybe, I don't know, together six months, he worked at the CBS station, local CBS station, and we were good friends. We'll see who was, who's been in Chicago a long time. We were good friends with, the, uh, with John Duncanson and Sylvia Gomez. Okay, I don't know if any of you remember John and Sylvia. I remember yeah. Sylvia. Yeah, they're just this delightful couple on CBS and they got married and they bought a house in Lincoln Park and they invited us down and we went down for dinner and uh, Sylvia in the middle of dinner just got up and walked over to the cabinet and bought a bowl. She just got a bowl. She brought this bowl. She put it down on the table. And she said, and if any of you all get married and you get into premarital counseling with me, you're going to hear this story. So I'm just warning you right now, because this is this story gets told in every premarital, of every initial premarital counseling session that I do. Sylvia set this bowl down and she said, this is your relationship. This is what you two are creating together. This is all that matters. It's all that matters in your relationship. If it's not about you, Walter, it's not about you, Tim, it's about this thing, this shared meaning that you are creating between you. And as a result of that, that means that it's very possible to be unhappy with the other and still be very passionately committed to creating the thing between you. You see the difference? As opposed to, I'm not, I don't like you tonight. So I've been, there have been plenty of times whenever I've gone to bed and said, I'm not really happy with Walter Swift and he's gone to bed, I'm not really happy with Tim but we have both been gone to bed happy with this thing that exists between us because mm. that's been the thing that exists. That's what we're building. And so they said, you always got to put something in the bowl every day of your life. You got to do something that shows that you're committed to this thing that you, that's between you. And sometimes it's, you know, it's nothing. Sometimes it's, you know what, I'll make the bed. And other times it's, look, I got trip, I got tickets for a vacation. It could be anything, but it's something goes in the bowl every day. And one night we just had one of those terrible nights where I just decided I better go to bed because if I stay up and we keep arguing, somebody's going to get hurt. You know, you ever have those kind of where it's like, uh, you know, if this goes on much longer, it's just not going to go. It's not going to, it can't end well. So it's like, okay, I'm going to bed. And I just went to bed mad. And I woke up in the middle of the night and on my side on the bed table, there was a Snickers bar. My favorite candy bar in the whole world. And I woke up and I just got out of bed and went out in the living room where he was sleeping because it was not going to be that kind, it was that kind of night, you know, and tapped him on the shoulder and said, what is this? And he looked up at me out of his sleep and said, I realized that all day long I hadn't put anything in the bowl. 
that's the what Uber is talking about in terms of relationship between others. And I'm not holding us up as a great example. It's just a great story. I wish I were telling it about somebody else, but it's just a great story. But what he's talking about is when you bring your whole self to the other, you don't line up perfectly. You create a new, a kind of a shared meaning between you. So when we're thinking about othering, quite often what's happening when we're othering other people, non-Christians or women or people of race or gay people, whatever you want to do, what we're doing is we're doing this top thing. We're doing this detached thing of categorization. We are not taking the time and the energy to engage people as whole people. You see what I'm saying? To create meaning between them. Now we're going to see how this works because Jesus' whole ministry and everything that he's about is about justice and wholeness, rescue, salvation, saving us from ourselves and making us whole. And we see this over and over again. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved or rescued, will come in and go out and find pasture. There will be food for them. They will be free. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But what? I am the gate. The gate came that they might have life and do what? Have it abundantly. Wholeness, bigness, all of that. In another place, you know, Jesus says, let anyone who's thirsty come to me and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Wholeness, abundance, this idea. He's talking to the disciples that I've pointed. I've talked about this scripture a million times to y'all. But he's talking to the disciples and he's telling them he's about to get arrested and killed. And then he looks at this and looks at him and says, look, I've said this to you so that you may have peace. I've just told you this whole thing's about to blow up. But I'm telling you so that you can have peace. In this world, you faced persecution. Yeah, you got some hard times. But take courage. I've conquered the world. I have figured it out. I've broken the code. We're going to love these people. And we're going to love them right back into, right back into life again. I've conquered the world. And so Jesus's message is all about this. Now, I want you all to look at this real quick and see if there's something else that somebody sees. Is there anything that these texts have in common? It, just look, glance at them. They're all from John, which is They're often all from about John. the gospel that is about love. They're all from John. They are all from John. And John is, we're going to get to John in a minute because the text that, that Jeff initially asked about comes out of John, and we're gonna see how this goes. This whole idea of the promise of what Christ is bringing to us in its highest form is, is constantly over and over and over again in, in John. Jesus keeps saying, I am this and I am that. I am the gate, I am the bread of life. I am all of these things. Eventually I am the way, the truth and the life, which is the text we're gonna look at in a minute. But I am all of these things and they always point to wholeness and to salvation, to rescue. Now, let's keep going for a minute because it's gonna get even more interesting here. How our tradition and our ancestry though has a very different idea about all of this. And that is that there is this idea that starts in Judaism and transfers itself seamlessly into Christian thought. And it is this idea of othering as a way of self-defining and self-determining. There is this idea that comes out of the ancient Hebrew mindset that the, 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 the nation of Israel is God's chosen people. There's scripture on top of scripture throughout the book of Exodus. You can't, I mean, you can't throw a rock in any chapter in Deuteronomy without landing on a verse where God reminds him, you are chosen. You are my people. I am by all of this. There's this idea of cho the chosen people here, chosen by God, lifted out, separated, effectively saying God othered Israel in an interesting kind of way, right? And then this carries over because we forget that Christianity is a, began as a Jewish sect. And so this idea of chosenness gets translated into what's called election, in the New Testament. Those of you that have come out of Chris, you're a Presbyterian, I'm a Presbyterian, we love election. The Presbyterians love election because we just think that means God chose me, God knew before I was born that I was gonna be one of God's very own. You know, there's a lot of that in mainline Protestantism, though some of the fancy words predestination, these ideas that 
there's this, God has already picked me. God picked me. And you get in First Peter, you get this very famous verse that we love. You're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're God's own people. There, Listen to all of that language. That's all Old Testament language, right? That's all children of Israel kind of language. In order that you might, pro, might proclaim the mighty acts of him or Jesus who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. We love that verse. And we, oh my God, I can't tell you how many, there's songs that are written out about this, just whole songs that are written about this and brought me out of darkness into the marvelous light. All of this stuff is in there. We don't often like to talk about what comes before it. Ah, uh, yes, so you can, you can do this for good or for bad. This is what Peter's saying. To you then who believe, he is precious. Jesus is precious. But for those who do not believe, then he goes to Psalms and pulls some stuff out of Psalms. The stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. He's just categorized the entire, the entire synagogue that is not following the Christian faith. He is entirely, he is entirely shamed his own ancestry right there. And we don't talk about that, right? So Judaism becomes the not so chosen or the no longer chosen people all of a sudden. That's problematic. And what do, what do, what do the elect folks become? The obedient believers. And so this idea of othering is built into even our texts. It doesn't make it right. We don't believe that the Bible is flawless. So we know that there are problems in these texts. And we can't just, that's why I get really nervous whenever I get around folks that love to quote a verse here and a verse there. And it's like, wait a minute, what are the, I stop, stop, stop. What does the verse before that say? What does the verse before that say? Could you tell me what the verse after that says? Because quite often, these things are taken, ripped so far out of context and, and, and presented as truth that you could be convinced by them without really understanding really what the message is or what the circumstances are. Just like I could tell you that everybody, all these votes that are being counted today are just late breaking votes that people are voting after the election. We know that's not true, right? But that's the story that somebody's going to tell. They take it out of context. I didn't mean to bring that in, but I, did. I couldn't resist it. It is this idea, right, that I can say a little bit about something and present it as categorically true. What it's not getting me to is any kind of shared meaning between me and the other folks. Are y'all with me still? Can I make a comment? Yes. Um, I think you, I, I think this, this lesson is so important because I, I feel as, as a Jew and someone who was raised as a secular Jew, but this idea was so instilled in me and not by my family, mm -hmm. but by the, the, the secular, it was the Sunday school, but it was more cold. That this idea though was still like, in sort of embedded and ingrained in our psyches. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, telling my parents like that it really, that it like bothered me and that I'm like, just because we're Jewish, it doesn't mean we're any better. I'm like, did God really choose us over other people? And my parents had their own ideas, which was really to dispute that. But I remember how uncomfortable that was for me as a kid, but mm -hmm. then when other people would challenge that and sort of in and sort of move it into the the sort of world of christianity then i almost got sort of defensive and i got well hey wait a minute <laughs> 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 the real chosen people not you what are you <laughs> talking about yeah you know that's what the bible says yeah so i never like being really uncomfortable but yet also not wanting to sort of relinquish that too, because that mm -hmm. felt dangerous to me. 
So it was just weird. It was. It and, it, was and these are these are those I it moments, right? Where things are just being things are people are trying to make sense of things and they're categorizing things and they're not thinking through them, right? So, what's very interesting is we have these three great faiths that we all call the Abrahamic religions, and nobody is better, or for lack of a better word, worse at doing this thing than these three groups. Dana, thank you for bringing up the whole, because there is this whole idea of Bahir in Judaism, which means chosen, right? And this is about nationhood. And you are chosen through Abraham. We are all the seed of Abraham. That theme is not going to go away in the New Testament, by the way. It's going to continue. We are, you know, uh, I grew up in Sunday school singing, Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had Father Abraham. I mean, this stuff is just ingrained in this idea of nationhood, that God has decided there's a nation that God is going to favor. And then we got to Christianity and we had a problem because if we were, if Christianity was going to make any kind of unique claim, it was going to be, it was going to be grow out of Judaism, but Christianity was never going to be a nation. So we're going to become a people, a movement, and we are going to be elected. The word there is eclectia, the idea of being elected, of being salvation, then we are rescued through Jesus Christ. And now you're beginning to see a pattern is emerging. Okay, so it's nationhood through Abraham, salvation through Jesus Christ. And then you get over into, uh, into the whole Muslim world and Islam, which comes a few centuries later. And you've got, well, let me go. I've got to go back now. See, I'm trying to read my slides here. You've got Hadaya, which is divine guidance. And that, according to, Mis uh, to Islamic thought, comes through the Quran that are the words that has been given through the prophet. That's why when you, when you talk to Muslim people, they say there is no God but Allah and what Muhammad is his prophet, right? That is, that's the way, that's the guidance. We say, I thank God I've been saved through faith in Jesus Christ. You know, there is this, and, and the, Jewish, the, the confession on the Jewish side is we are God's chosen people, a nation that has been set apart from the beginning of time, all right? It, these are all I, it constructions. They are not I, thou constructions. They would say, who are you? Let's talk to one another. Let's find meaning. Uh, meaning. And in, used to use a, a familiar kind of seminary term, Shay, I apologize because I know you're still studying and it gets a little brutal sometimes. There's this idea of what we call over against. I am either sort of, I, I'm taking supremacy. I'm taking, I am taking the top rung on this ladder against what your claim is. None of, of these over against ideas in our faith, these in and out kind of ideas, not one of them leads to wholeness. I will say it one more time. Not one of these ideas that puts me in opposition to you leads to wholeness. I think that's what our nation is struggling with right now. We are all on one side or the other and nobody's thinking, is there any meaning we can create between us? And we are all feeling incomplete right now. For that very reason, we are not finding ourselves to wholeness. Now let's keep let's keep going. So now you get to the clobber texts that are not aimed at LGBTQ people. These are very common clobber texts that get aimed at people who are not followers of Jesus. The big one, of course, that that, that Jeff quoted that we can those of us that grew up in an evangelical circle. Can, and, and maybe most Protestant circles can quote in our sleep. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. At the risk of being cavalier and a little coarse about this, it's, it's, what, it's Christianity's equivalent of an SOL statement, isn't it? It's just like, oh, too bad. Just too bad. If you don't, if you don't get in this way, that's not how it's going to work. The other one, when you start looking up salvation through Jesus Christ, if you Google it, that verse, and then Acts 4.12, those are the ones you can always show up. They will always show up. And that is Peter and John. They have just healed the lame man at the temple, and they've been called in front of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, and they're giving, they're explaining how they were able to, to heal this lame man who was unfit to go into the temple. Now he's healed, 
And in the middle of this, they're saying, this is, this is all by the power of Jesus. This is this Jesus that you kind of stood by and let get crucified. This is this Jesus who nonetheless rose. This is this Jesus who gave us power. And then they say, there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. That's another one of those, oops, too bad for you kind of statements. They make folks nervous. Now, I want to be very clear. And I want to say something very clear here. I'm a Christian. I am a Christian. Gather's a Christian church. I believe in Jesus. I am a big, 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 huge Jesus fan. My, I have committed my life to Christ. I have done that. Okay. Do I, I, that's who I follow. And that's why I take all my teaching from. But at the same time, I don't think that Jesus expects me to follow Jesus in, a, in such a way that I make other folks of other faiths feel other than. You see what I'm saying? And Jesus himself didn't do that. Jesus just talked to everybody. So who we claim for ourselves and the way that we are going to participate in our faith, that's fine to own that. You shouldn't be ashamed of it. You should own it. But you should own it in such a way that it is not harmful to other people. And that's where we get into trouble. We all know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that God gave, right? His only son that whosoever believes in him I keep wanting to do the King James Version because that's what got tattooed in my head from when I was a kid. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And you just keep going. For God sent his son not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You just can all of that in John 3 when he's talking to Nicodemus. Then you get into 1 John 5 and 12. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. Then we go over to Jesus. Uh, I'm going to go to the far right where Jesus is talking to, uh, to Martha when she, he shows up and, and Lazarus is dead. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. These are some very big, seemingly Christ-specific kind of claims. And then you get the one that uh, you always use as part of the plan of salvation, if you're taught the plan of salvation growing up, right? If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All of these texts, if they're ripped out of context and not used properly, would suggest that it's like, uh-oh, if you don't get on this bandwagon, you're never going to find God. So, Tim, mm -hmm. when I was in school, somehow we had this question, or we made it up, what if there was life on other planets? Would they have they had their own Jesus or they just got a luck? That's the problem, right? That's the question. Let's not even go there. What if you were had the what if you had the bad luck of being born in China 500 years before Jesus showed up? We all know that the Chinese dynasties were in place. So what if I just happened to be born in what is now modern Beijing, but I was born there? BC, you know, before the Christian era, BCE, 600. Am I out of luck? What if I am living today in, you know, somewhere in India where I have no contact with any, any Christian understanding at all? Or the Amazon. Or the Amazon. Or at the top of Finland with the labs, right? Or some of the some of the other native peoples that we've talked about. Where is all? Of, how does this work, Lisa? Yeah. Well, I, it, you know, and I always think to myself, um, you know, like my my sister in law, who's a very traditional Christian, and I I, I would think if she lived in Jordan, she mm -hmm. would be, you know, she would clearly be like a mainstream Muslim, right? Yeah. And so, so but like all of those people that are just living the faith that they happen to have been born into and if it's not christian so what does that mean mm -hmm. doomed you know that's the problem right well you know how i deal with have dealt with it all these years tim you know uh coming mm -hmm. from pentecostal church and having these things drilled into my brain yep um uh, just only short of a real drill mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the pain uh but um <laughs> yeah it's uh, uh, uh the way i come to terms with all these verses is I don't believe it I believe that God has um, 
can see more than just the we see in three dimensions. I think God sees in other dimensions. Mm -hmm. There's got to be some way that God knew their heart or 500 years before Jesus. There's some way that God knows. God doesn't think like we think. It, I, I just, it can't be that surface. Didn't Jesus say something about people that don't know God, but they have in their heart? Jesus says it's out of the abundance or the fullness of your heart that your mouth speaks, right? And it's not, you know. that people are getting into heaven that because they had, they had truth in their heart, but they have never been exposed to. Well, there, Paul says in his, in his letter to, uh, to the Romans, uh, is it the Romans or the Corinthians? I'm now I'm just showing how, how rusty I am with my Paul, my early Paul, but, um, He's just, I know it's in Romans, where he says that the Gentiles, meaning non-Jews, have an innate moral understanding of the very same thing that the law would want to say. That he says that the law is written on the tablets of our hearts. We have an innate understanding of right and wrong that is, that, that is plenty enough, sufficient enough to guide us without us having to understand there are all of the well, 603 commandments, right, of, uh, in, in the Hebrew Bible. You don't need all those. If you just have, if you have a good, a good moral center and a good moral conscience, you should fulfill what the law is expecting and what the law is laying out anyway, right? But Jesus also says something very interesting whenever he's talking to the disciples. And again, this is in John. He's talking to the disciples and he's telling them that he has, he's going to go away and, you know, he's going to be taken from them for a while. And then he says something that, oh, oh. When you throw this one out, it just kind of puts everybody in all the, it's like, it's like a bunch of race cars hit a grease spot and everybody starts spinning because it's this, it is, I have sheep in other pens or pastures and I must bring them also. And he says this to the disciples because I'm going away and he effectively says, I got to go see about some other folks. I have sheep in other pens or pastures. I must bring them also. And then he doesn't. He doesn't belabor it. He doesn't stop and say, let me, you know, let me, I'll send you the footnotes on this. None of that. He just says, I got other, other people that you don't know about. And that's a really wonderful and reassuring statement for a lot of us who are wanting to say, there's got to be something, a bigger story going on here, right? Now, I'm going to ask again. Let me go back. Hold on. Anybody notice anything about these verses? Not all of them, but do you see a trend here? More John. More John. Lots of John. So it's very interesting. John is the love book and John is all of I am the way and I am the gate and I am the door. But yet we seem to see a, a lot of this kind of language that when it's ripped out of context feels exclusionary. It's an it. Now, how is that? Well, first of all, I'm going to remind you, and you've heard me say this a million times, when we're reading these texts, we have to remember we are reading somebody else's mail. We are reading mail that was sent to people 2,000 years ago who lived in a world not remotely resembling our own outside of some basic biological needs like food and shelter. That's about it. And so we all, and we can just all of a sudden read that, just pick it right up and say, you know what? Oh, here's what it says. Well, that's my, it's written for me, it must mean exactly what I think it means today in America in the 21st century. No, 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 no. We need to know who were these texts written to and for? Why were they written? What are the urgent concerns that are behind these texts? What is the theological premise or the basis for the arguments that are being put forth? And when we look at John, we get into some very interesting stuff. Because John is the last of the four Gospels to be written. It's written very near the end of the first century. Jesus has probably been gone for close to 50 years before John shows up. So do the math. That would mean that John, the book of John is to Jesus being here, what? Oh, I don't know what, 50, I, I can't even do the math. I'm bad with math. But it is this idea that we're reading, we would be reading something about what was going on. Books currently about Dr. King were written about something that happened 50 years ago. 
the space of 50 years changes the way the, the life of Dr. King is interpreted, right? So this is the late first century community of Jesus followers. And the prevailing theory behind all of this, based mostly on the content of the gospel and the letters, is that this, this gospel and the letters of John were written to a group of Jesus followers who were kicked out from their synagogue or their larger Jewish community. It was just that this bunch had just had enough Jesus. This synagogue had said, that's enough of the Jesus stuff. Thank you very much. Y'all go get your own thing started. And so there's a very heavy anti-Jewish tone throughout John that is really hard sometimes. Jesus is always fighting with the Jews and it's always the Jews that are causing the problem in John. And Jesus is now set up as not a rabbi as he is in other, in other Christian sects that are growing up in Judaism. Jesus is the rabbi whose teachings they follow in Judaism. No, 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 no. When John comes on the scene, Jesus is the only way. That's it, y'all. That's it. We are not, we are not, we are done with trying to navigate this. We are putting all of our chips on this. And that's why there are huge variances from the other gospels and the other early Christian writings. For instance, there, and we'll talk about this in, in, in a little more detail, but John has a whole different idea about who Jesus is, how Jesus came to be, what Jesus' meaning is in the world than the other gospels. In John, we all remember, what's the first chapter? You know, in the beginning was the word. Those are the opening words of this gospel. And the word was God and the word was with God and the word was with God from the beginning. Later on, he came to his own and his own received him not, but to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons or the, and the daughters, the children of God, right? There is that all of this text comes in this idea of Jesus being already this being God as God and the logos and this idea of the word is actually a Greek notion. It's not borrowed from the Hebrew culture. It's borrowed from current Greek culture, that there is a reason, a logos, a word behind the cosmos, a logic to everything. And, and John is saying, this is who Jesus is. And that's why Jesus is the only way you can forget it. This all, they didn't receive him. Forget it. Just forget him. We're moving on. And so I'm being hard about it. I don't think that because John writes a whole lot about love. I'm not I'm just trying to be really dramatic with you understanding that there's a there's a clear break here that we don't see in the other gospels with the Jewish community. There's also tinges of what are the early seeds of Gnosticism. And if you know anything about Gnosticism, every now and then I wind up at a cocktail party stuck with a Gnostic and it gets really difficult because they know all these little details of stuff. The Gnostics though, had this way of making hierarchies. The Gnostics loved to other people because Gnosticism was based on knowledge. And the more you knew, the more privileged you were and the more set apart you were. And there were all of these sort of ladders, very much almost like modern Scientology, all these different levels that you went through in Gnosticism and ancient Gnosticism. And you would get this high up and you would have these encounters with angels and all of this stuff was going on in Gnosticism and this idea of enlightenment was a really big idea in early Gnosticism. And so the Gnostics would look down on anybody that wasn't as smart as they were, thank you very much. And they were very just brutal about it. They were just other these people. And that's why and sometimes later in Christian writing, you say, don't let those folks get in your, don't let them get in the church and start talking that stuff because it will turn, it will hurt people. It will create division. There's one scripture where Paul says, just mark them if they come in and start trying to cause division. And so there are tinges of this idea, though, in John, that's very interesting, that takes Gnosticism to a place, it, it kind of borrows that idea of, there's an elitism that kind of goes through John. And this idea of the Logos, that is the word with, that's with God before creation, Jesus is the cosmic reason made flesh. We beheld his glory. And throughout John's gospel, we keep seeing the writer lift Jesus. In fact, Jesus actually says, if I get lifted up, from the earth, I will draw all people to me. And it's a reference not only to being exalted on the cross, but being exalted above all other things, right? And there are all these statements where Jesus keeps saying, I am, I am the bread of life. I am the way, I am the gate, I am the good shepherd. And he's echoing the voice of God. If, you're, if you are a Jewish listener, you hear, I am who I am, because that's the voice that God says to Moses from the burning bush. Burning bush. 
Who sent me? Tell them I am sent you. And Jesus takes that in John. We don't see that in any of the other gospels. In fact, in Mark, Jesus is presented as sort of this scruffy rebel po prophet. You know, he's got this North, this North Shore movement and not in the good sense of the North Shore. Sorry, Harry, no offense to Deerfield, but it's a different kind of North Shore. It's, a, you know, it's this whole idea of the North Shore being where all the, the common people live. And that's how he's presented in Mark. He's impatient. He wants to get this show on the road. He, uh, he wants his people to, to get a hold of this. In Matthew, he's the promised Messiah. Matthew is written specifically to people that are awaiting the, the arrival of their Messiah. And in Luke, which is written to Greek Christians, Jesus is seen as the supreme savior. Jesus holds a position that in ancient culture, Caesar would occupy. But in John, Jesus is the only way. And that's all there can be to Jesus. Jesus is not contextualized in his time at all in John. He is precedes and he stands apart from, and he is often, he is a unique person unto himself. This is what we call high Christology, this idea. And I love, I love it all. I'm not, I want to be very clear. I'm not disparaging John, but I want us to have all of this context because when we read what Jesus is saying in John, it takes a certain kind of tone because John is portraying a certain understanding of the ministry of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the death and resurrection of Jesus, and what Jesus means. And it's very, and it's tempered by the nature of the community. Now I got almost all pilgrim folks here tonight. Out in the other gatherers, they're off doing whatever they're doing. But I got the pilgrimers here. There's a certain way that you all have created your community. There's a certain character to pilgrim that is so, I love, you know how much I love pilgrim. Pilgrim is a certain way, and you are that way in response, not only to what you want it to be, but also responding to what you think it should be, because you're trying to create a wholeness that can reach out and can meet the needs of the community around you. You follow what I'm saying? John is doing exactly the same thing in these writings and in these letters. He's creating a sense of community and reassuring these people, you are on the right path. You are doing what's right. Following Jesus is a good way to go, even though they've kicked us out of our synagogue, even though we're not even, you know, we have a whole different idea than many of the other Christians have. We are still, you're on the right path. And when you read John with that behind you, you come to a better understanding of some of those verses that folks would use to singularize and tell folks that aren't Christians, you're not Christians. That is not at all what John is saying. In the, in, the, in the community, the interpretive community of John's community is doing what, what um, oh, I just, this just came the other day and I can't recommend it highly enough. One of my professors, Rachel Mikva, her new book just came out called Dangerous Religious Ideas, The Deep Roots of Self-Critical Faith in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and it's beautiful. And, uh, and she points this out in a really wonderful way that John's community is exclusive and inclusive. Meaning, you know what? If you're not following Jesus, you can't get in. But anybody who wants to get in can come in. You see the difference? As long as you are just signed on to your belief in Jesus Christ. But in John's gospel, these claims are directed to specific believers. These are people that are already in. These are not statements that are made about it getting in. These are helping you understand what's going on where you are. It, John says it, in the famous one, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John is talking to Thomas. He's not making, he's not preaching. He's not saying to an entire crowd, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's saying, I got to go away. I got some stuff I got to get done. You all, I'll be back. I'll come back to see about you. And, and you know, meanwhile, you know the way. And Thomas goes, well, I don't know the way. What are you talking about? I know the way. We know the way? How do we know the way? You haven't really, you know, the, the, I, I must have missed that lesson. What do you mean the way? And Jesus just looks as if you're looking at me and you know me, you know the way. Because what am I am? I'm the way and I'm the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You got what you need. It's all right here. You don't need to go look at anywhere else. I have demonstrated what this way is to Thomas. He says to Nicodemus, it's to Nicodemus who comes to him by night and says, we know that you are a ruler sent from God. Nicodemus professes his faith. This is not a conversion. And even Jesus isn't trying to evangelize Nicodemus at all. Nicodemus has already said, hey, I'm in. I'm on to this. I'm part of this. 
but I don't understand it. And that's when Jesus says, well, let me explain. God sent God's own son to the world so that the world, and this is a big universal idea, the world can be saved. This is always kind of comes back to this, right? Mary and Martha, it's specifically, Jesus is saying to Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. You, what you need to know in this moment is this, is I'm what you need right now. And then you get over into the epistles and these are pastoral letters and they're directed again to believers. This is to validate your testimony, your understanding of who you are. This is not for you to use like, like you're the HOA board deciding whether or not you're gonna let somebody buy a unit. That's not how this is supposed to be working. This is about you understanding that if you have the son, which you do, I'm writing to believers, I'm writing to the church, you have life, you've got this already. This is important for you, okay? Now, in the, we get these other two texts where it's all about lordship, about the name of Jesus and confessing the name of Jesus. Does anybody have a hat, can guess why that is? Where are they living? What's going on in the world? Whose name is everything happening under? It's under Caesar, right? This is the subversion of the church. The confession of the lordship of Jesus is that Jesus, you know, we're not putting our lives under the control of Caesar anymore. We're putting our lives under the control of Jesus Christ. We're following the way of Jesus. And I love that they're very clear about this. This is a mortal question here. This is an earthly issue we're taking. There's no name we're under heaven. This is not a heavenly problem. Okay, this is not a metaphysical issue. This is okay. This is who we're laying our, this is where we're placing our bets. No name under heaven given among mortals. So if you don't get the under heaven part, we'll just make sure you understand this is about us. This is about the choices that we are making by which we must be saved. And this is declared to a Jewish community that's trying to dispute their authority, right? Their authority to heal this person. It's like, I got authority in Jesus's name. I'm doing this in the name of Jesus. That's who I'm following. I don't need clearance from Caesar or anybody else. I got the I got what it takes. It's just like when you go to uh, you go to some places. Let me say. Let me let me see if I can find a good answer for this. You go to one desk and they say, "Look, this is not the right desk for this thing that you need. You need to get this cleared up. Wrong desk. You don't need to get this." But tell them, tell them that Marianne sent you. And go over and you tell them that Marianne sent you and just go tell them right when you get there, they'll put you to the front of the line, they'll take care of it for you. It's just that basic. This idea of the name of Jesus is a name that gives us authority. That's why we pray in Jesus's name is because that's on, on the authority of Jesus. Paul is writing to the Romans and he's just saying, you know, look, his message to the Romans is always the same. Well, excuse me. It's always faith, 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 faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Faith is, you know, faith comes from hearing. It's always faith, 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 which is trust. This word means trust. And so it's in him, all Romans writing, he's writing to the churches that are, this is the hot, they'd be like writing to churches in DC during the era of Trump saying, just keep believing, hang in there, trust, 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 trust right? And know that this trust that you have placed in the name of Jesus and Jesus is your alternative to imperial power. You have been given, you've been empowered with an alternative. And it's, in, it's this confession of trust here. If you confess that Jesus is Lord, that means I got no use for Caesar. Caesar is second. He gets to come second. You know what? I've got, I've got my faith has been, my trust has been placed in something higher and greater. These texts that people will use to say, if it's only Jesus and you're not doing it, are all inflating what the original intent of these texts are. Uh, is, am I making sense to anybody? Yes, indeed, but I have a stumbling block. Okay. Uh, I have a little story ahead of time. When I was in junior high school, the principal gave us a value uh, 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 lecture when we graduated, and he said, uh, "You'll become either a stumb a uh, a stepping stone or a stumbling block." And so I've lived with that since junior high school. So uh, the stumbling block that I want to point out here is that part of uh, the uh, stumbling blocks of Christianity is uh, that it was designed in a in a autocratic and and under uh, under Caesar. 
Yeah. And so it does not really have an answer to uh, societies and, and things. You have to go to the Old Testament because it being determined uh, by uh, the, the domination of Caesar has, uh, has become a stumbling block. And so by itself, uh, the New Testament is really not capable of addressing uh, a, a, a society that is not under Caesar. And so, exactly it, right. it, it, yes. it, 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 well, I'm glad I'm right. <laughs> Thank you. No, you are. No, you are. Because we, the, 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 the ethic that drives Christianity is rooted in its, in its Hebrew roots, right? It, it's in the Old Testament. It's where we find the ethic of community and faithfulness and the way that we build and lift one another up. Because really, the texts that we have in the New Testament are all subversive. They're designed to get you out. That's the way that's supposed to be. It's like what we got, what we're going through right now. We don't, we're not going to be part of that, y'all. We're getting out of it, and we, we're just turning our backs on all of that. And so it, you're right. But the stumbling block word interests me, uh, Bill, because there was actually a slide in here much earlier that got taken out because it's just like oh, it's it's so much. And I'm already gone over what I wanted to go over with this stuff. But there, there is this idea of the scandal of the gospel that is all runs through the New Testament. This idea that the gospel calls us to be scandalous in the way that we embrace people, in the way that we behave, in the way that we reject authoritarianism, in the way that we live into freedoms and equality and equity. And it's a scandal. And that word scandal, which actually is a scandal on in, in, uh, in Greek, means stumbling block. And, they, and the apostles taught that our behavior is meant to confuse people. Our behavior is meant to make people go like, what, what, wait, you know, are they, how are they loving everybody? How are they doing these things? Bonhoeffer was famous for saying, you know what, someone, we gotta figure out how to love Hitler. We gotta figure out how to do it. And, you know, we gotta figure out how to do it somehow because that's because as evil as Hitler is, the command that's been placed on us, the scandal of how we are is that we love. That's the challenge that we have. And it's a problem that a lot of Christians aren't really ready to dive into that scandal, but you're right. It is a stumbling block. The, what makes it scandalous is that we are rejecting any sense of earthly power that would supplant the power of God that we exercise in the name of Jesus, right? But the community that we are built in is deeply rooted in the ethos of the Hebrew community. And all of those ethics and all of that understanding of what fairness is and justice is, is rooted in the prophets and the law. That's why Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy them. I came to fulfill them so that you got this. You got this sense of what this is. Now go take this thing and turn it, turn the heat on the love and go for it. You're going to get killed for it, but go for it and see what happens. And so there is this and so I love the idea that the gospel is a stumbling block. I love that I have some friends that just can't get over my faith. They just, they just, it's a struggle for them. I love that because it means that that's something that's like, I just can't figure it out. It's like, can't help you there. So what, they will know us. Yeah, right? Exactly. Amen. Exactly. Fools for Christ. I'm, a, I'm all over that, y'all. I'm happy for that. Mick, what did you uh, say, Shannon? What did you say, Shannon? They will know us, right? They will know us. They'll know They'll us know by us. our love, right? Yes. By this will all people know, right? If you have love for each other, not even for everybody else, just how well you're getting along with each other, right? That's kind of an interesting idea. Rabbi Mikvah in her book says, you know, that, that we should think about Christianity along with the other Abrahamic religions as a self-critical faith, that we should always be pressing it and examining it and asking questions and we're not afraid of that. So it is not just a belief system that's been handed down to us. Other religions are, this is what it is. Just believe it, right? But in Judaism, Islam and Christianity, they're unique in the fact that they are what we call self-critical faiths. Their first question is always, what is truth? And they understand truth as not necessarily a North Star, that's fixed, but sometimes truth becomes a move. You have to get them, you have to work with it. Truth is not always settled forever and ever. Truth, what's true today, look, I'm, I'm not gonna tell you how old I am, I'm old enough to know that what was true when I was 14 is not true today necessarily, okay? Things have changed. We are constant, the world is in flux always. Then there are some things that are timelessly true. I still believe love makes the world go around, I just do. That's just a timeless truth for me. 
But there are other things that are, that are, I was like, hmm, that used to be true, but not so much. I used to believe that folks cared more about relationships than possessions. I don't believe that's true anymore. I'm hoping it might be, but I just don't believe it's true anymore. And that's just, that's me, you know? I used to sing a hymn, I would be true for there are those who love me. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> I would trust me. Yes. Me, who, those who trust me, I would Those who true. trust me. And yeah, you have that's that, and no, that's the act of faithfulness, right? That is the act of faithfulness and fidelity. You trust me, I'm obligated to honor your trust. Yeah. There's also room for doubt and self-critical because you can't have faith if you don't have doubt. Yeah. That's the whole thing. There should be some things that are always troubling us. Jeff, I really appreciated that back when you brought this up, it's like, this troubles me. We should always be questioning. We should always be pushing, saying, I don't know if this makes sense. I love that our last discussion, it's like, well, how do we work this out? That's where faith, because at a certain point you go like, I don't have the answer, but I'm just going to have to trust that this is taking me somewhere. Well, I'll give you the list. Oh well, yeah. I'll give you the long list. <laughs> and, and so that means you're a person of great faith. <laughs> I must be. Yes, indeed. That's the way that works, right? <laughs> then we also need to be alert to the potential harm and exaggerated emphasis that we can come on. I think that a great example, we can look outside Christianity. There's plenty to talk about in Christianity just even today. But there's also things that we can look at. For instance, we know that uh, Islamic terrorists are doing this in the name of Allah, but they're, they are doing harm and it's an exaggerated emphasis that is out of keeping with the teachings of the Quran. We know this. So we don't categorize all of Islam as terrorists. That's foolish, right? That kind of stuff. So we're always alert to the potential harm. And we are always questioning our capacity to succeed. That's got to be a big part of our faith. Can I, can I get over this hump? Can I do this? And that's why there's always this talk in scripture about maturing in your faith. What you couldn't do yesterday, you might be able to do today. You might be able to trust just a little bit more. You might be able to let go of some of that other stuff. You might be able to say, well, you know, this has always bothered me, but I realize that I've spent too much time on this. I need to spend a little more time over here. And so this ability to sort of self-correct towards success. The other thing I want to believe, want you to understand is that truth and tolerance, are the, the community defines what's true and what should be tolerated. That is the job of the interpreters of the text. The texts are not written as these arbitrary rule books. They are written for us to be interpreting and, and deciding what we will allow and what we believe and hold true as a people, as a community. And then we begin to live into what we say we believe based on how we, how we interpret our faith. What is this call of following Jesus? What does that mean in this community? What does it allow in this community that may not be viable for other communities? What are other communities doing that we might not seem to be viable? The community is the heart and soul of where the interpretive act happens. And a lot of times we forget that. And we say, well, you know, this is what, we, this is what the preacher said. The preacher's interpreting. That's what the preacher does. The preacher interprets. And that's what happens. And so that's why we are drawn into community. That's why there can be so many different Christian communities with so many radically different beliefs, because that community has decided what is true, what it will tolerate, what they, how they talk about their belief, and how they interpret their faith. So there's a big difference in the end. We believe, I'm a firm believer in salvation and wholeness through Jesus Christ. I'm a witness to that. People ask me, are you saved? Oh, you best know I'm saved. I'm saved. I am saved. And don't do, and you can't make me doubt I'm saved. Jesus came to my rescue. And I can tell you the moment, I'm not like the old, the old church saints, I can tell you the day and the hour. And it was long, I had allegedly been saved for a long time, but I was laying across my bed, 16 years old, crying because I knew that I was going to have to let my parents know that I was same gender loving. And I knew they were going to cast the devil out of me. And I knew that they were going to send me away. And I knew that it was all because of this religion, this Jesus thing. And I had said, I don't know, I don't know why I love you to Jesus. And it was, you love me because you know I love you. 
And when the minute that that happened, that was my rescue. It was like, you know, I don't care what they tell me about Jesus. I know what I know. Jesus loves me. I don't know why. But I know Jesus loves me. And that's going to be enough for me. And it was a very real moment for me. It kind of screwed up my whole family because it really messed up my family because I walked out of that experience saying, y'all can't, you can't convince me any other way. I know how I'm made. I know who I am. And I know that my God loves me. And you can tell me, you can spend, we can talk about this all night long and it's not going to change what I know. I know what I know what I know. I am loved. God loves me. Jesus loves me. But there's a difference between me knowing my, that believing in salvation and wholeness through Jesus Christ and constantly reaching for wholeness day in and day out, knowing where I'm lacking, knowing that there's something that I can find in this, this way of Jesus that works for me. I'm not saying it works. My, my buddy Ajit, who's a devout Hindu who lives in Delhi, it doesn't work. Jesus doesn't work for Ajit. Hinduism works for Ajit, but this works for me. There's a big difference between saying that that Jesus, Jesus is the way and the truth and the life for me and turning around and saying salvation and rescue and wholeness are only available in Jesus Christ. There's a big difference. Our I testimony. Could I, could I say yes, something? Yes. Oh, uh, I just wanted to clarify something that um, if uh, sometimes my train of thought goes. Uh, but um, uh, it sounded a little wacky at uh, third dimension, fourth dimension. But um, my thought was that Jesus, that God would be able to see through the ages someone's heart. Had that person been raised and, and taught about Jesus, whether they would embrace Jesus or turn away from Jesus, reject mm -hmm. Jesus, if mm -hmm. they were taught that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and so that's how I get around that is mm -hmm. that um, God knows your heart. Only God, God knows, knows heart. the heart. And, all, and God what, can what see through time. Say? And yeah. had somebody been raised and had the knowledge, if those 500 years prior, that yeah. particular one person knew, had been, had the knowledge, would they, God can see whether they would have embraced or would, whether they would have rejected. Yep. Yeah. Um, being raised in that. So people today who, who know about Jesus and all, they don't accept Jesus. It's, they weren't raised with that. God can see their heart. Did they, if they were, would they turn or would they embrace? And the, and the question is also that this gets into a whole other area, which is how are those of us that are following Jesus presenting Jesus to the world, right? I have a lot of friends who were raised in the church and got up and saw how Christians are behaving these days and they're like, yeah, never mind. Never mind. I'll just, you know, I'm just our gonna... modern our modern Christianity is so different than what it was 2000 years ago. It totally um, was. Yeah. So think... all kinds of Bill and I were on the so phone the other I, day. I, I was I, talking I... about how Christianity had changed, like around yeah. around 1000, right around the feudal era, there were these radical changes in Christianity. And I know that we're not to judge. So that kind of takes the pressure off me. Completely. It, it kind of reminds me of, um, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Megan Phelps Roper, who left Westboro. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and and the, what led to her leaving Westboro, when, when she talks about it, is the love and compassion that a certain group of people had, whilst at the same time she was being trolled by by lots of liberal Christians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But actually, the thing that converted her was this love and compassion by a group of of people going, "Wow, I mean, yeah. that must really hurt being faced continually with this hate." Mm -hmm. And it led to her leaving Westboro. Yeah. And she also talks about, you know, leaving Westboro was 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 massive. Yeah. Anyone yeah. leaving a cult, when you leave a cult, you're on your own. Yeah. And and well, you that, walk into a world where people hate you. Well, not only that, you're also leaving a cult in which hell is very real because all they're talking about is hell, right? Excuse me. Some of us came out of traditions where hell is very real. And, you know, I, I've told the story. I think I actually preached about it once. My first grade teacher in Christian school who when 
nobody would cop to the fact that they had misled us and we all stayed out for an extra 15 minutes of, of, of uh, recess. And she wanted to know who started that story that recess was an extra 15 minutes and why were we so late getting back in line and everything. And nobody would cop to it. She said, well, if you don't tell us who, if you did it you, and you don't say you're a liar and all liars have their place in the lake of fire that never goes out. She was threatening first graders with hellfire because somebody had told a fib. That's nuts. That's absolutely not. I'll bet it worked. <laughs> well, we all, then I, I did what about half the class did. We all saw that, wait a minute, maybe I did say something. I don't think I did, but just, I don't want to go to hell. And all of a sudden everybody's hands went up and then she couldn't, it was like, now we're all Spartacus. I mean, it was just chaos, you know, this whole notion of, of, of what's going on. When you live on that kind of edge, that's a real problem. I'm not going to take a lot of time with this, but if you ever, it, I want to call, some of you know this scene, and I want to show you how this scene often gets overlooked when we start talking about Jesus is the only way and all this kind of stuff. This is Paul, and he's in Athens, and he gets taken out to the Acropolis, and he starts talking to them, and he says, you know, by the way, I was roaming around your town, and I saw an altar inscribed to the unknown God. Well, this is who I'm talking about. Well, what? That's what I'm talking about. And look, you know, we believe in the same things. You know, it's like from even from the beginning, he made he took one person and made an ancestor from you know this one ancestor. All nations grew up, you know, and we are all doing. This goes back to Jeff and some of your points and and Mary some of your questions. We would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find from this is a universal thing that's going on. And even your own poets have said we too are this God's offspring. All of a sudden, Paul's like saying, yeah, let's pull, let's take the fences down, y'all. Let's recognize what this is really about. If Jesus has just came to be adored, that's one thing. But Jesus has already said, I'm the way, I'm the gate. I'm supposed to get you to God. And if that's the end game, getting to God, then we don't need to be so worried about what the gate is necessarily. And that's where we get ourselves lost is trying to keep everybody in one on all in our lane. And I'm frankly, there are just too many people in this lane already, if you ask me. We don't need a whole lot more people in this lane. We need to get the right folks in this lane who make some things move instead of spend there trying to kick everybody else out of the lane. And so that's kind of the way it goes. So there is a difference, and I'm gonna just get this very quickly. When we think about our faith, we think about it as a particularity. This is particular to us. What we believe, it's particular to our time and our place. Again, I just happen to be born in America in the 20th century in a Christian house. Dana happened to be born in the 20th century in America in a Jewish house. That's the way that works. Some of us were born into agnostic homes. We were, this is, it's particular to our time and our place and our cultural understandings and our traditions. And we need to relish the beauty in these particulars. The story of Jesus is beautiful to me. There is no greater story you can tell me. That's beautiful to me. I love it because I was raised in it. My culture supports it. I was taught it. I weep when I think of what God has done for me and what Jesus means to me. I shout sometimes. I laugh. There is so much about my relationship with Jesus that's particular because of the time and the place, the culture, all of that. But there's also a universal understanding also that we have to understand. And that is that what we believe can never be at the expense of others whose culture and time and place and traditions lead them to a different path and a different understanding because it still comes back to what Paul says. We would search for God and perhaps grope for God. There's something bigger than the path and our own path. You know, there's the many idea, they all, all paths will lead to the same place. Once we accept that me being on my path, I can come at it either of two ways. I can categorize you as a non-Christian and spend all my life trying to get you into my category and keep telling you, if you're not in my category, you know, too bad for you, so sorry. Or I, that's the it, the I and the it. Or I can look at people of other faith as the I and the thou. I am finding wholeness in my faith. I'm assuming you are finding wholeness in your faith. What can we do to create meaning between us? What can we do that binds us together? 
What can we find? And it's going to be the same things, by the way. It's going to be love and it's going to be justice and it's going to be peacemaking and it's going to be care for the planet. Those values are common across all the faiths. And so a lot of us have been, we've got these triggers that we've got to untangle in our heads about any time we hear people talk about this. And it's not about getting out into, I mean, I'm a big fan of interfaith stuff, but it's not about creating a civic event where we all get together and we let a Muslim pray and we let a Jewish person pray. And we let, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about active participation with people of other faiths and accepting them and honoring their faith and their ancestors and their future generations, just as we read at the beginning, so that we can create meaning in this world. I was watching the... Uh, the, the um, okay, I'm gonna shut up, but I was watching the, the election coverage the other night and I was watching my favorite channel and you could probably guess what it is. And, it, and, uh, and Dana was up, uh, you know, watching with us because we all live in the same building and we had dinner and watched it together. And I just said to her, looked at her in some way, I said, they are not talking about any of the concerns that are driving right-wing voters. They haven't mentioned any of the concerns. They have just written them off. And there are people that are deeply impassioned by questions of abortion and courts and you could, whatever you want to talk about that we always want to be dismissive of. We're othering them, just like we other people of other faith, just othering them. Oh, they have that. Oh, you know, the Buddhists don't even have a God. Okay, we'll leave that alone. Oh, they have that. Othering them instead of saying, wait, let's bring our whole selves to this. There's some meaning. There's got to be some meaning we can create out of the wholeness of who we are, as opposed to me saying, this is my category, I'm over here, you stay on over there. And that's what I love about this place and everybody here is we just like everybody, just come on in. We're Everybody come in and be whole and we're going to create meaning between us. We're not gonna worry about categories. I'm gonna close with one of the great 20th century saints, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who asked famously, who is Jesus Christ for us today? And he asked that in 1939 to pastors in Germany who were struggling under the weight. This was the subversive church that was not going to give in to the Caesar of their day, to Hitler. He said to them, so we have to figure out who is Jesus Christ for us today. And when we think about this idea of how non-Christians get othered, it's because I think Christians have not grappled with this real question. Who is Jesus for me today? Who is Jesus for us at Gather today? Who is Jesus for us as Christians in the 21st century today? That's a powerful question. And then he says in ethics, the one who looks at Jesus Christ indeed sees God and the world as one. God is not removed from God's creation and can see from then on and from then on not see and can from then on not see God anymore without the world or see the world without God. Who is Jesus Christ for us today? It is a God that opens our eyes to plurality, to all of the different ways that God can be expressed, to all the different paths that can lead to this great maker and creator that we call God. And so I would, I would say, we're, I'm gonna tell you again, I'm gonna hit this, I'm a Christian. I am very particular about that. I am a Christian. I believe I've been saved. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe that. I believe that Jesus rose to prove that there was life. I believe all of that. But not to the point that I say anybody that doesn't believe what I believe is in trouble. Because that makes my God really, really small. And I just will not serve a God that small. Just not going to do it. That any, any final thoughts? Next week, we're going to look at women patriarchy and patronization and patterns. There's this weird pattern theology that's on the loose that seeks to, if you haven't heard it, you're gonna love, love this, the patterns. So we're gonna talk about some of that next week and how that, how scriptures have been abused to mistreat women. We're gonna get into some of those funky sections about women being silent and all that kind of stuff and try to figure out what's going on there too. So we're gonna spend some time with some of that next week. It's get time to give, y'all. I appreciate you giving. You know, I always, this is the part I always apologize for, but we we have to do some stuff. So I want to. You all are so faithful and so good and so generous and kind, and I just bless you all for your. You've been so wonderful, and we're doing. We just keep moving. I'm still working at it. I just wish I had more. Boom. But yes, 
I'm going to be calling a few of you on the west side to, to see about doing some ride arounds with me to look at some spaces. And we're going to be doing that probably between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So don't get too busy baking because we're going to look for some spaces where we can do some community outreach. And since y'all live in that neck of the woods, I kind of want to make sure that I'm making availing myself to some of your wisdom and insights and all of that. So we'll be talking about that. Any final thoughts tonight? Anybody have anything you, that you're burning to say about, to, did this help anybody? Did it, did it confuse? I don't know. Just what are your thoughts? You know, Tim. I thought it was. So, oh, go ahead. Sorry, me, Tony. Sorry, it's fine. It makes me sort of happy that we look at other faiths in this, in this community of uh, gathers because as I just said before, it like we come from like traditions that are really like conservative and really radical. Like like what Chris was saying, I heard about that story mm-hmm. and I found it just so amazing. Mm-hmm. And and it, it makes me relieved that we actually try to find how universal all religions truly are with Christianity and how un- universal these concepts truly are. Yeah. Once we embrace the, then our particularity becomes really cool, doesn't it? You know, it's like, we all have to wear clothes, but my style is my style and y'all just better back off. That's the particularity of my, of my style, right? Belief works that same kind of way. That's the way it is. Tim, you were going to say something? I just, I mean, I think today's talk just really resonated with me. I think it's, you know, it's so, t- you know, it's timeless, but it's also timely and, we're constantly putting people in buckets, whether it's on the political spectrum or a religious spectrum. And it's, you know, I think the fact that we've got a community here that's just so inclusive and, uh, and then helping to understand, you know, the, the kind of theology behind it all, I think was just really good. Oh, good. I'm glad. I think it's really, I think for me, the thing that's sort of my big aha moment, sometimes y'all should just, I should, I should publish all the drafts of the slides. So you should see how sometimes these things start, they're really awful. And then some, somehow another something, and sometimes they stay awful, but sometimes something happens. And all of a sudden it was like this idea of the wholeness, the whole other coming together with another whole and respecting the wholeness of another individual to make meaning. That's a powerful idea to me. It's a very liberating idea, right? And it also lets me say that if I'm reducing you to a category, I'm missing a whole lot. And I think there are a lot of impoverished Christians out there who are just so determined to have be in the exclusive way. This is the way, this is the way this works and there's no other way. And they are missing so much wisdom and knowledge and spiritual experience by not bringing their wholeness to someone else's wholeness. So conscientiously working on uh, uh, an awareness in ourselves of other, uh, when we other people. I like what you said very early in this talk too, Tim, is um, that there's a, like with the newsboy, mm-hmm. sometimes you just have to, for, what did you call it for? Just for, for necessity, you just said, you have to work. Necessity, yeah, you, you can't work. dissect everybody. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you're, you're, there's too many stimuli going on at any one time. Mm-hmm. So we do that and it's a natural thing as humans. But uh, sometimes we can be pretty blatantly vicious about it. And that's when we need to catch ourselves, I think, mm-hmm. as Christians and uh, not allow ourselves to go there. Exactly right. There is this, I mean, you can go to the other extreme where you're just trying to be whole with everybody all the time. And that could mm-hmm. just be crazy town too, right? Because you just can't, I mean, not everybody News wants to engage and... you in that way. Some folks want yeah. me to be in the it. But some people, I'm that strange queer minister. And right, that's, but some I'm people are it. called to that. Some people might be called to that, like people ministry or street ministers and such. Yeah, yeah. They're called to talk to the homeless. They're called yeah. to talk to these people. Right. So, you know, it's not for everyone. Nothing but it's, is, but. And, and Boober was brilliant in, in saying that. There are two kinds of engagement with the other. There's the I, the it, the categorized. This is what I do, you know. And then there is the I and the thou. And the I and the thou for his mind was the highest kind of engagement. But we can't all, everybody, you just couldn't keep everybody on that level and get through the day. How would you get through the day? I just don't know that it would be possible. Right, very good. Yeah. The boobers are happy tonight. The boobers are happy tonight. Thank you so much. The boobers are happy, huh? Did somebody else have a comment? Did I hear Tim? I wanted to say thank you, though, because 
there is that rich meeting that we discussed, but yeah. also the, at the same time, you were able to kind of help me to weave through some of the like, ridiculousness I grew up in that phase mm -hmm. and where John was so twisted, that book. And, and mm -hmm. so yeah. sometimes until you bring it up, I don't question it. And so mm -hmm. I'm able to kind of sort through some of that, you know, yeah fundamentalist upbringing at the same time and that was really apparent tonight with our discussion with oh good good it. there's a there's a thing and, and i want to be um i want to be uh cognizant and merciful uh for those of us that come from these deep evangelical roots to be aware of something that most of our tradi our tradition was raised by auto i mean was created and the theology was sort of shaped by autodidacts these were people without a tremendous amount of education that did not have access to a lot of education, who all they had was the Bible and a couple old books that somebody gave them. And they're reading and trying to figure this out. And they are also meeting constantly because evangelicals love to go to church. So they got to preach all the time and they got to get this thing kind of codified and put, picked out, you know? And so what that does is, I'm, and I'm not being critical, I, I, there's a part of me that is very, I bless them because they also put a tremendous fervor and love of scripture into me, right? But at the same time, they were making a lot of assumptions. And then when they would, when you could say, well, there's more to this, then they, where the, the problem is, is no, they just throw the curtain. Never mind. I don't need to know. I don't need all that learning. Well, that's the problem then, right? But the, these initial impulses, a lot of them spring out of a, I'm reading this, and as far as I know, this is what it's saying, without knowing that this is what, how this book came into being. This is the, these are the forces that shape it. They didn't have, they weren't looking at ancient Greek. They weren't looking at, at historical circumstances. They read Jesus as Lord, and they don't connect that to Caesar. They, they don't have all of that. And so I bless them for their fervor, and I bless them for their love of scripture and for their commitment. At the same time, for me to be whole and to be free, I also have to extricate myself from sort of what their, um, in, their inadequacies were. And I, that's, I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, that what they lacked just by circumstance. I have to say, okay, I'm in a better place. And that just kind of opens that up, if that makes any sense. It yeah. does, it does. Because until tonight, I hadn't ever questioned the special holding pin where people went if they yeah, were right. for Jesus. And I, I'm sitting here like realizing that, oh my God, no one else knows about the holding pin. So <laughs> like, uh, I, yeah, right. Carlton Pearson, uh, I don't know if you guys know that name. He was a mega church pastor in Tulsa. There's a movie that was on Netflix about him. Uh, he's a very, uh, very prominent African-American pastor who was a huge, huge. Carlton was the, just the, the cat's meow. And he read that verse and got up in church the next Sunday and said, y'all, I think we got something wrong here. I think that we are... We are doing this Jesus, Jesus, Jesus stuff at, at the expense of everybody else. And I don't think that Jesus is behind this at all. And when I read this, this seems to indicate that we've got to make room for all these people of other faiths and people who don't behave like us and act like us. And he had a church of several thousand people. And the next Sunday, he had like 60 people show up. And his church fell apart. He was here in the city for a while. He's part of the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries. He's a bishop in the, the, the organization that, that Gather sits in. But when you talk to, you know, and I'll see if I can find, I don't know if the film is still on Netflix, but it was a wonderful film that told the story of how he was pushed out of his, of a church that he built because he read that text and said, this seems to indicate that there's more going on. Maybe it's, maybe Jesus is talking about people on other planets. Where's Mary? Maybe that's what he's talking about. Creator, creatures on other planets. Maybe he's talking about people of other planets. We don't know, but it's certainly enough to say, we don't have the pipeline to the truth all to ourselves. It's just not ours alone. Mm. No, that why? Doesn't mean, but that doesn't mean that what we believe in isn't true. It just means that we don't have exclusive claim to it. And that's the way that you got to come at this. Yeah. Oh, I've gone long and I didn't mean to be this long, but I just, I've been feeling kind of rich. Uh, you so. were, thank you. Listen, uh, listen, keep an eye on your email for worship opportunities for the upcoming Advent service. 
Uh, you're all gonna get real busy with turkey concerns. So I wanna get those out tomorrow and get y'all busy before, I, I, but nobody's having company, are we this year? It's kind of weird. Okay, uh, so, uh, but the, there's still, the holiday stuff is gonna start. We'll figure out how to make it crazy because that's what I we- I don't do. have Thanksgiving, Tim, I'm fine. Are you okay? Well, there's a role for you, Chris, trust me. There's a role for everybody. So, uh, there's, so we're just going to uh, make sure, I will tell you this, we are going to go through the four stages of the four Sundays of Advent in that one service. And we're going to do candlelights for all four of those sections. And then we're going to end when we do communion, we're going to light the, the Christ candle that would, we would light at Christmas because we won't be together at Christmas. So your communion thing will be communion and then lighting a white candle. So I'll, just if you're out in, you're out in, I don't know, what are these, you know, a store, a Target, you see a white candle, get one because you're going to need a white candle. But, uh, <laughs> but that's, but that's, so we're going to include the final candle lighting of Advent as part of our communion in the final thing. So just be ready for that. It's going to be a lovely time. That's the last, that's the last Sunday of the month, right? Last Sunday. That's, so I'll be preaching for Pilgrim in the morning service on the 29th and I'll be and we'll be all getting back together for gather that evening. So as I said before, I, I apologize. You get a double, you get double dose. I really am so sorry. But anyway, <laughs> we will, uh, this time I'm gonna let you all go. Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you that we can all occupy enormous space in our hearts and in our spirits and in all around us that you have made that we can bring our whole selves together and make meaning as a community. God, we're so grateful. We thank you that your wisdom leads us to love and to honor and to respect and to make space for the other so that we can learn and see you in the work that happens between and among us. Be with us, be with us as we go through the next few days. Keep our hearts, keep our minds, keep our soul, keep our blood pressure down, keep our nerves at bay. Just help us to go forward and we will give your name the praise for all of the beauty that you will visit upon us. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Good night, all. And we will see you all. all. Have a wonderful weekend. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. <laughs> all right. Party. Hi, and bye, bye, Marcella. She left already. Okay. Bye, <laughs> bye you guys. Bye.